Cool. So, let me introduce myself. My name's uh, uh, Leonard Apelson. I uh, currently head of data science at a startup uh, uh, called uh, Anomaly, which uh, uh, basically detects and eliminates healthcare fraud. Uh, I'm also the author of Data Science Book Camp. So if you're looking for uh, practical uh, data science projects uh, to work on in the Python language, do check it out. And for context, uh, uh, prior to my current role, I had years of experience doing uh, data science and machine learning in the natural language processing space, uh, which is why uh, I, for, uh, for today's particular discussion, I cho chose to talk about uh, natural language processing analysis of large text data sets. Uh, through the course of this discussion, we'll be uh, focused on, uh, uh, we'll focus on the basics of uh, uh, representing text as uh, matrices and vectors. We will uh, develop the commonly used TFIDF statistic from first principles and eventually we will go on to uh, cluster uh, tens of thousands of textual documents uh, using uh, basic uh, data science clustering algorithms in such a way that, that we can explore those clusters uh, visually and uh, uh, learn relevant insights. So let's get started. For the purpose of this particular analysis, I'll be using uh, the very famous uh, 20 news groups uh, data set coming. Uh, it's, this is a collection of uh, thousands upon thousands of news group posts across a myriad collection of topics from the mid nineties. And it's commonly used to uh, test the model of uh, natural language processing algorithms and real world data. data. So let me import this data set from the uh, scikit-learn machine learning library. I'm going to eliminate all headers and footers just to from the news group post to make sure there's uh, limited noise. And let's actually be loaded the data in. Let's actually print out uh, the names of uh, the various news groups. We're dealing with a lot of topics, people. We got atheism here, computer graphics, uh, medicine, uh, stuff for sale, uh, uh, baseball, etc. And so, uh, again, this data represents actual textual documents. So let's uh, post the text up from the very first news group posts. Here it is. In the 90s, someone wrote, I was wondering if anyone there could enlighten me on this car I saw the other, the other day. It was a two-door sports car. Looked to be from the late 60s, 1970s. Blah, blah, blah. It's a very car-specific uh, posts. And it was probably posted from the car discussion news group, uh, news group wrecked out autos, which we can uh, confirm by uh, uh, outputting uh, the actual news group category of the post from newsgroups.target, uh, from the newsgroups.target attribute. Yep, it's from uh, wreck.autos. Uh, so uh, let's uh, continue with our, uh, uh, with our, uh, discussion here uh let's uh look take a deeper look into the the news this news group data set by uh printing out the data size uh we just uh take the length of news groups data and we can see that we're dealing with over uh over eleven thousand posts that's a lot of textual data so in order to analyze the data more comprehensively we'll need to vectorize it we'll need to represent the data as a matrix of uh, vectors in this matrix each uh, row of the matrix will represent an individual news group post and each column will represent an individual uh, word across the vocabulary of all 11k uh, news group posts uh, so uh, the actual matrix elements will be the count of every instance of the word uh, within a particular post, uh, within a uh, particular post. So get these counts, we are gonna use uh, uh, scikit-learn's uh, count vectorizer. It takes a collection of documents and vectorizes them by uh, counts. Uh, these counts are also called uh, term frequencies and hence the document vectors are also referred to as term frequency vectors. So let's uh, import the count vectorizer and initialize it 
using kind of a uh, the the standard uh, uh, pre preset settings of this uh, vectorizer. Okay, cool. We got our uh, account vectorizer working. Uh, now we are ready to vectorize uh, the text using a fit transform. Again, this is going to give us a term uh, frequency matrix, which we are going to call a TF matrix. And after vectorization, we'll print out the matrix. So vectorization will take about a half a second to run. And we're seeing this output. This isn't your uh, standard uh, NumPy uh, 2D array output. This TF matrix is not a uh, NumPy array. So like for those who don't know what it is, we can check by looking at the type of the TF matrix. Uh, it's a SciPy sparse CSR matrix. Uh, so a CSR matrix is uh, uh, basically a, a row specific sparse matrix data class available through the SciPy package. Uh, sparse matrices are matrices that are mostly zeros, which basically corresponds to the nature of human vocabulary. M most of the words in English language aren't uttered in many of the sentences you state. It's sparse. And sparse matrices, obviously, there's a lot of benefits to using them. Uh, uh, in terms of basically memory requirements and also uh, just certain fast computations. There's some trade-offs too in terms of lookup. Uh, so uh, again, uh, trade-offs and benefits. Uh, in a lot of very large scale uh, uh, text analysis, you definitely want to use sparse matrices. But for the purposes of this discussion, I want to uh, convert uh, the sparse matrix into a 2D NumPy array just because uh, just for those of you who are feel more comfortable with NumPy to kind of keep that consistent. And again, there's a lot of oh, there's there is a whole bunch of overlap between uh, between kind of like NumPy indexing and uh, uh, SciPy CSR matrix indexing. I'll mention a few of that briefly, but for the time being, for consistency's sake, I'm going to use the uh, the two array method to convert uh, this uh, uh, TF matrix into a, a, a two dimensional NumPy array into a NumPy matrix per se. So we did the conversion, and this is uh, this this type of output is something we're more more used to uh, seeing. As we can see, uh, most of the rows and all of the, all the rows and elements we get a preview of our zeros, indicating the sparseness of uh, of this text. Okay, so let's actually take a look at the vocabulary size. As I stated earlier, the number of matrix rows represents uh, the document count, about eleven thousand and uh, the matrix columns corresponds to all the unique words used uh, in uh, this vocabulary. So we'll print that information out and we see that we're dealing with like over uh, uh, 100,000, over 110,000 unique words. That is, that's a lot of words. But uh, again, due to the sparse nature of human, t uh, human language, uh, most of the news group posts will only hold a few dozen of these words. So we can measure the unique word count of a post uh, by counting the number of non-zero indices in a particular uh, row of the matrix. So let's look at an individual vector. We're going to uh, associate it with the first matrix row, aka the first data set element, aka the car post we were examining earlier. Uh, TF, uh, so we're, uh, we're going to get out this uh, term frequency vector and we're going to use NumPy's flat non-zero uh, uh, function to get out all the non-zero uh, indices. And then by counting the number of non-zero indices, we get a, a sense of uh, uh, the uh, number of words mentioned in the very first news group post. Okay, so uh, look, we, we got the count. Uh, there's 64 unique words within the post. Here are actual, well, there were actual word indices associated with uh, these posts. And if you wanna get the words associated with those ind indices, we have to use uh, the vectorizer's uh, get feature names method to uh, get the words, and then we can map the indices, non zeros indices back to these, these unique words. Again, these are words we saw before, 60s, 70s, car. Um, 
Uh, so we know what words are mentioned uh, in the post, but all, not all these words are equal. Some posts are, are mentioned more frequently than others. So uh, let's actually take a look at the word counts. We're going to look at the top uh, 10 most frequently mentioned words, both in this first news group post uh, and to kind of like help uh, sort and organize the tabul the, the output, we're going to uh, store uh, the words and their counts in a tabular pandas uh, data frame. Okay, so looking at the four most frequently mentioned uh, words, uh, we're we basically seeing that, uh, uh, again, there, there's only four words that are mentioned more like at least four times. And the first three words with that high quantity of mentions are all boring. Words like the, this, was, there. These are pretty useless words. Only one of the words, uh, car, is uh, meaningful. The rest of the words are called uh, stop words, the most common words in English language. And for the most part, words like the are so common, they are particularly worthless. So we want to filter them out before doing any subsequent analysis, hence the name stop words. We, we want to stop from using them. And we can actually, uh, doing that filtering is actually quite easy. We just pass a stop words uh, parameter into count vectorizer during initialization. Um, and um, that'll filter out commonly known English stop words. So, of course, this will, uh, if we rerun the vectorization, the, uh, the, the number of columns in our matrix will drop and common stop words will no longer be present in our vocabulary. So look, we did stop word filtering. Now let's uh, uh, regenerate the top 10 most frequently occurring stop words um, uh, in this post. So let's say looking at this output, uh, now uh, the after stop word filtering, the number of uh, unique words in the post dropped from about 60 to 34. And the very, uh, the most frequently occurring word is car. It occurs four times and that's a good sign because this post is in the car category and eventually we're gonna wanna uh, generate information about these categories automatically uh, using, uh, using clustering. Uh, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, uh, like looking at the, or the rest of the words, there, oh, the rest of the words occur only once. So they're hard to rank and compare to each other. And some of the remaining words are, uh, you know, uh, this sort of car specific like model. It, it could be referring to a machine learning model, but in this instance, it's referring to a car model. It's car relevant. And then there's this word, uh, really, which is a really general uh, word. It's not really car specific. It's specific to, to nothing. It's bland. And that blandness uh, means that it appears in a lot of uh, different news group posts and a lot of document types, irregardless of, uh, of category. Uh, and so because this word is so common, it common is it's gonna it's gonna appear in a lot of documents, and that document count is a useful uh, signal. We can uh, we can reference this document count to sort uh, words by relevancy in a much more intelligent way, and let's talk about how we can do that. So uh, so look, some of the thirty four words. Uh, appear, you know, each of our 34 words appears in a certain fraction of news group posts. And this fraction of uh, kind of documents in which a word appears is called the, it's called the document uh, frequency. And our assumption going in is that words like really are going to have a much higher document frequency because they're so bland and boring and are used, um, used everywhere. So uh, if we can get out the document frequencies, we can do a much more, uh, carry out a much more intelligent sorting uh, mechanism. So uh, let's proceed to do just that. Uh, you wanna get the document frequencies for all the 34 words uh, within the post. And the first thing we wanna do is uh, uh, select, uh, all, get a sub matrix where we take our uh, term frequency matrix and we only keep a uh, focus on the columns uh, that reference words present in the first news group. 
So let's do the submatrix and uh, just as a sanity check, we'll print out the first row of the submatrix corresponding to our term frequency vector for the first news group post. And we can see that as expected, only one of the words has a count of four, the word car, the rest of the words are all one. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, again, uh, uh, these uh, vectors have counts and the submatrix have has of course counts and all its elements but the for the purpose of uh, getting uh, the document frequencies we want to turn these counts into binary values yes or no is this word present in the document or no is it absent to do that we'll use scikit-learn's uh, built-in binarize function we're gonna binarize the matrix and now uh, the matrix is basically pretty much all ones for uh, the, a vector, the vector associated with the first news group post and mostly zeros everywhere else. Again, here we see that in uh, in the third document, the third vector uh, in the second to last element, the, the second to last, uh, the word corresponding to the second to last column is present. So uh, now that we have the, uh, the binary instances uh, the, uh, uh, that basically tell us if a word is present in a document, yes or no. We can get the actual uh, uh, counts of the number of documents that each word is present in very easily. We just take this matrix and we just squish the rows down by summing them up. So now we're gonna uh, just sum up all the individual rows of the binary matrix using uh, dot sum axis equal to zero. And what's that's gonna, what that is gonna give us is um, a single, uh, uh, basically a single array of word counts. So we know that uh, the word at index zero is mentioned in 18 documents. The word at index one is mentioned in 202 documents and, uh, and so forth. So I, I just wanna also uh, reiterate that uh, uh, kind of like these uh, sequential step of uh, procedure executions can be carried out in a very uh, simple, elegant line of code, both in uh, using uh, NumPy nested arrays, but also uh, the SciPy CSR matrix. So let's just uh, do uh, do the this aggregation more elegantly and to to regenerate the vector of word counts. Cool. Uh, so we actually have the word counts, which we use to uh, compute the document frequencies, which is like this word count vector divided by the entire data size of uh, uh, of like about 11,000 uh, 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 documents that gives us the frequency with which each word, each word appears in each document. And now as a sanity check, again, we're gonna store these outputs along with the counts in a pandas data frame and a, a sanity check uh, will output words with uh, high document frequencies, words that appear in uh, at least 10% of uh, the documents. And look, uh, these uh, again, as expected, we see really, it's a really frequently occurring word. We see words like no, these are all boring words that we want to deprioritize in our, our ranking. So now let's uh, recompute the rankings we saw earlier using both word counts and document frequencies. Uh, so we want to prioritize word counts, as hence we're going to rank by count or uh, uh, count first uh, in uh, descending order. And after that, we are going to rank on document frequency in uh, in ascending order. So. Uh, words that appear uh, have a lower document frequency are going to get a higher ranking. So let's take a look at their uh, ranking output. So the word car still comes out on top of the list, which is uh, which is great. Uh, and then here amongst the top 10 most ranked words, we're uh, seeing car related terms like bumper and like doors, uh, but we're doing something right. Uh, only so our ranking system is right. But it's cumbersome because we have to rank on two separate columns of our pandas data frame and two separate quantities count and document frequency. So let's try to simplify our ranking by combining count and document frequency into a single individual score. So uh, 
And the way we can do that is uh, very simply just dividing the count by the document frequency. Uh, and that'll be our, our combined ranking score. So the higher the count, the higher the ranking of the word. The lower the count, the lower the denominator, the higher the ranking of the word. So the way we're gonna execute this uh, combinatorial procedure is first we're gonna uh, compute uh, uh, just the inverse of the document frequencies, one over document frequencies. And uh, this quantity is called, surprise, surprise, inverse, uh, the inverse document frequency or IDF for short. And then we just uh, uh, in, uh, multiply the count uh, aka the term frequency by the inverse document frequency and to compute a single score. Uh, and let's see what happens. Well, our results are not that great. Car no longer appears at the top of the list. We've seen words like tell me and, and funky. Something went wrong. What went wrong? Uh, if you actually look at the IDF, the inverse document frequency, we get a sense of what's going on here. The IDF for the top ranking words is really high, like in the thousands, whereas the count is low in one. And so the high IDF dominates the combined score too much so. It uh, uh, basically, the term frequency, the count loses all meaning because uh, the IDF values are so high. So we need a way to shrink down the IDF values. They can't be too high. And in data science, whenever you have any uh, real kind of like, you know, like uh, kind of like real value uh, parameter, or let me rephrase it, when you have like any float that's greater than zero and it's too big and you need to shrink it down, just take the logarithm of it. So let's say we take a lot, we have a uh, value here that's like a really, what is it? in the, uh, it's like 10 million, I think. It's really so many zeros, I don't even know what it, what it is. It's super high. I wanna shrink it down to eliminate its influence and, doc, and, and, uh, and dominance. I am, ju I just take a log base 10 of it and I get a value of six. So that's what we're gonna do with our inverse document frequencies. We are going to uh, take a, log base 10 of them, and then just multiply them by the term frequencies, by the counts, into a single combined score. We sort, and boom, car is on top of the list again, where it's like bumper and doors, uh, high, high, me high meaning words like bumper and doors appear at the top of the list. So our combined scoring metric work, and uh, the scoring metric it combines term frequency and inverse document frequency, which is why it's called yeah, term frequency inverse document frequency or TFIDF for short. And it's a super powerful metric for ranking words by, uh, by priority. And it's a metric that we wanna use to vectorize our documents in a more intelligent way, which is why uh, scikit-learn provides a TFIDF vectorizer class. It's identical to count vectorizer in almost every single way, except it uses TFIDF to vectorize documents rather than just term frequency. So again, we're gonna initialize a TFIDF vectorizer class. We're gonna st uh, st set stop words to English to eliminate stop words uh, and do a fit transform to create a uh, TFIDF matrix. But for the time being, temporarily, we're gonna turn into a NumPy matrix. And let's just uh, print out uh, the non-zero elements of the first uh, TFIDF vector in this TFIDF ma matrix. Uh, here, again, we're, we're seeing uh, TFIDF uh, values uh, uh, for, uh, for the document associated, uh, associated with our car post. I wanna point out that uh, these, uh, uh, these these values are are uh, they're all less than one, and that is because uh, a TF, the TFIDF vectorizer uh, uh, purposefully uh, normalizes all row vectors so that their magnitude uh, uh, their magnitude equals one, which we can uh, prove using uh, uh, using a uh, uh, the norm, uh, the norm function from uh, from the NumPy library. 
uh, it's uh, so uh, there there by the way the, for context the reason uh, uh, the reason this uh, the reason we are normalizing these vectors to one is to um, is to make it easier to take the cosine similarity between any two vectors for comparison although of course our matrix our TFIDF uh, uh, matrix is very large right now and uh, taking uh, the all by all cosine similarity of that matrix just isn't reasonable uh, so uh, I, uh, before we do any type of similarity analysis we want to uh, shrink this matrix down using singular value decomposition, a standard approach to uh, uh, to basically dimensionality reduction of uh, textual matrix data. For that purpose, we're going to uh, bring up a truncated uh, uh, SVD that is uh, the scikit-learns uh, SVD uh, implementation. And just as a quick aside, if we actually go into scikit-learns uh, uh, a truncated uh, SVD uh, documentation. Uh, we will uh, see that uh, uh, the, the documentation is very specific on how to analyze uh, uh, textual data. So uh, it's in there. So uh, if you're applying it, uh, applying SVD to extract a task, it's called uh, latent semantic analysis or LSA, and here it says uh, for LSA, a, a value of 100 is recommended. I can't tell you enough people, just read the documentation. It's if you don't know exactly how to optimize the parameter, scikit-learn is really great in that regard. So we're going to shrink the column size from like 100,000 to just 10 columns. I also want to do a brief aside that technically you can uh, you can like put a parameter into the TFIDF vectorizer that only keeps the like the hundred most uh, like dominant important words. Uh, I prefer not to do that. I prefer to include as many words as possible and then uh, apply uh, a dimensionality reduction per uh, uh, per uh, commonly used uh, parameter specifications. And uh, in the long run, I think my outputs are better off for it. Cool. So, all right. So let's. Uh, er, we're doing dimensionality reduction. It might uh, take a few seconds to run, and then what we've basically reduced our uh, our uh, what is it like over a hundred thousand matrix columns to a hundred columns, and uh, we've shrunk our matrix down enough to be able to compute uh, a cosine similarity. But first, before we do that, let's actually make sure that uh, check if the matrix rows are normalized like they were previously, by just taking the magnitude of the first row. So if the matrix rows are normalized, then the magnitude will be one, uh, but the magnitude is not one, it's uh, point, uh, point 0.49. So before we proceed any farther, we are gonna want to uh, uh, to normalize the uh, SVD output. Uh, t and we can do that very easily using scikit-learn's normalize me method. So we just do normalize uh, shrunk matrix and boom, now the magnitude of all of the first row is one. In fact, the magnitude of all the rows is one. So uh, right now we are dealing with a ma matrix of, uh, a matrix whose every row has a magnitude of one. So if you just take uh, the dot product of the matrix with its transpose, uh, by the very definition of cosine similarity, we're going to get a matrix of all by all cosine similarities where the ith row and jth column will correspond to the similarity between the ith news group post and the jth uh, news group post. By the way, uh, one thing that uh, not everyone knows about, but in the later versions of scikit-learn, you can totally do the dot product of two vectors or uh, the matrix product of two matrices using this at symbol, at operator. It's super useful and uh, it really simplified my own usage of, uh, of uh, uh, scikit-learn output. So it's something, uh, uh, it's, it's just something to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so let's actually compute this cosine similarity matrix that I've uh, 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 previously uh, uh, mentioned and uh, and discussed. 
Okay, we've computed the cosine similarity matrix, and now with uh, with this in mind, let's uh, uh, let's actually uh, compute the cosine similarity between uh, two randomly selected posts. So look, we we've randomly selected uh, posts at indices two thirty five and. Uh, 7,000 something. They have a really high sim cosine similarity of 0.91. So these, the content of these posts are, are nearly identical. So let's actually look at these posts. We look at the first post, something about capturing window 3.1 uh, output. Again, we're dealing with news group categories from the 90s. So of course, we're talking about Windows uh, 3.1. And now let's look at the post with which uh, uh, this uh, kind of text shares its uh, very high cosine similarity. Oh, and uh, okay, this it's funny. It's like this is a response to the previous post. So here, uh, we're ba we're we're basically uh, again uh, uh, we're we we're we're basically uh, viewing a uh, what should I call it? Oh. Uh, oh, it's not a response. It's, an, it's I believe it's another post. Uh, it's another post that uh, referenced like Eric w that referenced kind of like the identity of uh, of uh, Eric Wang uh, and his Chinese name. So it's another post by this uh, uh, by this user, and they're uh, again uh, kind of like their like internet handle like dominates uh, this output. Hence the high cosine similarity, and you know it's. As a sanity check, uh, our similarity metric is working as it should, but this is all a bit boring. Like we, we don't, we want to do more than explore uh, posts, the pairs of posts that are highly similar to each other. We want to see if we can cluster the posts by category, uh, by uh, by topic, and so let's proceed to try and do some clustering output, like uh, clustering outputs on this analysis uh, using. To two of the most common uh, clustering al algorithms at the disposal of uh, a data scientist, dbscan and k-means. So uh, dbscan is uh, intended to uh, cluster data based on kind of like its uh, their density in an abstract space. And what's great about dbscan is that unlike k-means, we can use any type of distance metric. It's not dependent solely on Euclidean distance, like k-means, which is why we can uh, pass in our own uh, a custom similarity metric into kind of like the density um, that will define what it means for two posts to be dense and close to each other. So we're going to pass in the metric of cosine similarity since the best way to uh, compute the similarity between two text normalized text vectors is by taking uh, the, uh, the 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 co cosine of the angle between them, and that's actually uh, we're going to run dbscan with uh, with a few reasonable parameters. We're basically going to assume that density defined by at least fifty uh, uh, fifty newsgroup posts uh, within kind of a uh, 0.4 units of each other. So we ran this clustering with arbitrary values for these parameters. And remember, we're dealing with news group posts covering 20 topics. So we're assuming, I mean, some of the topics like overlap with each other, but we're assuming that we're going to see like reasonably between 10 and 25 clusters. But if we actually count the number of clusters we obtain here, we've only obtained uh, three clusters. So our uh, our uh, DB scan clustering has uh, failed uh, uh, failed miserably, and uh, the parameters uh, that we've inputted just aren't appropriate. Uh, is there anything that we can do about that? Well, in the context of DB scan, not really. There's really no good way of optimizing DB scan um, parameters for kind of like this type of clustering use case. And there's really no good set of known DB scan clustering parameters in the natural language processing space. So uh, uh, we can't really rely on prior uh, prior literature to, um, to improve our outputs. So 
we have no choice here. We have to turn to k-means. And usually I'm very hesitant of using, a, a, let's say, a, so k-means only works in Euclidean data. For the most case, if you're clustering on non-Euclidean distances, uh, k-means is not, not the way to go can't really use k-means to cluster on cosine similarity. And normally I would be really hesitant to uh, use k-means in uh, on uh, kind of like non-Euclidean, you know, you know, on vectors that aren't normally treated in a Euclidean manner. But here, uh, in the case over normalized text vectors, I'm willing to make an exception. And here's why. Uh, the vectors are, uh, are normalized, as I just said which basically means from a geometric standpoint, the vectors are just, uh, they're points in a unit sphere, in a sphere radius of one. They're points that appear in the surface of the sphere. And uh, it's actually quite easy to show mathematically with basic algebra that uh, the distance between, the Euclidean distance between individual points on the surface of the sphere is very closely related to cosine similarity. And so while we have to be very cautious about when and where we use k-means, when dealing with normalized text vectors, uh, k-means is an appropriate response. I just have to emphasize one more time that if these vectors were not normalized, k-means would be a terrible uh, choice of clustering algorithm. But they are. So uh, we can go ahead and... Um, get started. The, uh, one of the beautiful things of k-means about this uh, simple k-means algorithm is that we can kind of estimate k using simple elbow plot over the every possible uh, value of the input k parameter, where k, of course, defines the number of clusters, the number of centroids we're going to be looking for. So uh, we want to do uh, compute the elbow uh, uh, plot over a range of k values, let's say, uh, I don't know, like uh, 1 to 60. Uh, if we compute the elbow plot using standard k-means, it's going to be slow as hell. So uh, to compensate from the slow, uh, slowness, we're going to use what is called, called mini-batch k-means. Here, uh, mini-batch k-means uh, samples uh, random subsets over a very large data set and basically does gradient descent to try and estimate out uh, the uh, these uh, kind of like K, uh, uh, you know, centroid values of interest. Uh, so I have a little test here that shows, uh, compares like mini batch k-means to the standard k-means implementation to uh, compare their running times. And uh, again, I look, mini batch k-means run uh, about basically 11 times faster than regular k-means, which is great. Uh, which means we can use it to generate the elbow plot. Now, uh, for the final, uh, again, mini, ba mini batch k-means, it's faster than k-means, it's not as accurate. So we're not gonna really use it for the final clustering, but uh, for the purpose of uh, clustering or running, you know, generating an elbow plot across 60 values of k, it should, uh, it should be uh, sufficient. I'm running it now. This is still not, not that fast like it might take like 10 15 seconds to uh to run it's a process of running but if we had actually used the 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 full k-means algorithm uh it would uh, be like 10x slower it would uh, uh it would take even more to run not sure what my plot isn't showing uh k-means uh and Jupyter Notebooks do that sometimes. Let me regenerate the plot. The plot do doesn't always appear within your Jupyter Notebook when, uh, uh, whenever a lot of memory is being used. So look, uh, we have an elbow plot. Uh, our, it's not the best elbow plot. The transition between, uh, you see like a drop at a K of 10 and kind of an elbow at the K of 20. There is no uh, real, there is no uh, no standard jarring elbow kind of like drop transition that you would expect if uh, there was a kind of like optimal boundaries between clusters. And that's because in the English language, uh, there very rarely is kind of an optimal boundary between topics. I mean, look, uh, some of our topics are talking about sports and others religion. 
uh, so there's a clear boundary there but some of their topics maybe one topic is talking about baseball another one is talking about hockey in terms of religion there's uh, maybe discussions of uh, you know Judaism Christianity atheism uh, the boundaries between what defines a topic in in language isn't clear because uh, again conceptually uh, human language is uh, hierarchically a very concept idea so we're not going to get clear boundaries nonetheless we can still use this elbow plot to say look uh, a k of 20 is a reasonable like k a reasonable cluster count to uh to select and this corresponds nicely with our preconception of 20 clusters being present in the data set so let's actually uh, cluster our news group posts into uh, 20 clusters by initializing a, a, a k-means object scikit-learn k-means object where the number of clusters is set to 20 and uh, yeah I'm gonna run this uh, analysis store that output in a data frame contain the uh, uh, mapping uh, uh, uh basically uh mapping each uh each of our news group posts to a particular cluster okay so we have uh uh as we know there's a post uh, there's a post that we've been this single post that we've been discussing earlier on in uh during the stream our car post and one of our 20 clusters contains that car post and so uh the question is uh do all uh, do do all of the posts within that cluster containing that one car post correspond to car discussions? To explore that, let's actually isolate the cluster uh, containing the post at index uh, zero. So look, we have like four. We know that about four hundred uh, posts cluster together with the car theme post at index zero, and let's actually. Uh, Based on our expectations, all those po posts are thematically about cars. So we're gonna choose a random post and uh, output it uh, within the cluster, output its content and see if it's actually about cars. And here we go. Yeah, so, yep, uh, this is a post. It appears in the rec.autos discussion group. Uh, I was wondering if anyone out there could, oh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, this post is actually, I believe it's actually a response to uh, the, the first post we look at. Uh, uh, Rush fan. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so this is a car, uh, a car related post. And in fact, um, following up on that question, uh, how, and of course it belongs into rec.autos. So how many of the of the 400 posts within the cluster actually belong to rec.autos? Well, we're going to count them. We're going to get the uh, the uh, the the post category of uh, the news group category of all the posts within this cluster and do a quick count. And like, look, about 84% of posts within the cluster appears appear in the rec.autos discussion group. But what about the other uh, 17, 16% of posts that are not part of the discussion group? Are they also correlated? Uh, uh, yeah, let, let, let's find out. Let's actually uh, print, select a random post that uh, within the cluster that, that does not fall into the rec.autos group. Here's interesting. So. Uh, this post appears in, you know, science.electronics. Not a, doesn't appear to be a car post at first, but then we start reading it. The father of a friend of mine is a police officer in West Virginia. Not only in his word as a skilled observer, good in court, but his skill as an observer has been tested. Um, blah, blah, blah. Something about radar guns. A radar gun in some cases. He can guess a car speed uh, out uh to within two, three miles per hour just by watching it blow by. Uh, so so uh, this is a post that mentioned cars and mentioned like basically uh, the speedometer usage to measure the speed of a car. So even if it's in the electronics group because of the speedometer discussion, it's still about automobiles and measuring the speed of the automobiles. So how about the other 60 or so posts present in like the are not autos indices, AKA 
uh, the news group, aka present in the 60 or so news groups that are not part of the rec.autos uh, category. Uh, how do we, are they relevant to cars? How do we evaluate their re relevance? Well, we're going to evaluate relevance of uh, kind of like the most relevant representative words of those 60 or so posts in a very simple manner that is pretty much adjacent to what we did earlier when we countered the number of uh, or looked at the ranked word uh, relevant words across uh, uh, across an individual vector. We're going to take our TFIDF matrix. Uh, we're going to take the indices of those 60 or so posts. And then we're just going to sum up the rows, aka we're going to basically sum up the TFIDF scores for all the words that appears in those 60 posts. And we're going to rank them by TFIDF sums. And what that uh, operation is going to give us, summing up rows to get a single relevancy vector and then outputting words associated with that vector by their relevance, is that that's going to give us a sense of how important uh, all the words across the 60 posts are to kind of like, to like defining their category. So let's do that now. So look, we've ran, uh, ranked uh, the words in these posts by the sum TFIDF values, and we can see that car appears at the top of the list. Car and cars, like as an aside, we could totally aggregate cars and car together using a process called lemmatization where we eliminate plurality can easily be done in the commonly used NLTK uh, uh, Python natural language processing package. We're not going to worry about that now. We know that these posts are dominated by the discussion of car and cars, but we're also seeing, uh, you, you know, discussions of radar and like radio, car radio and speed and miles and also detection. So, uh, uh, these uh, non rectat auto posts are all about uh, odometer usage, you know, using radar guards to measure the speed of cars and maybe like using like the best types of car radios and so forth. So they're all very uh, car specific, even though some of them might fall in the electronics category. They're really about cars. And so this clustering is uh, legitimate. And we can do that, uh, basically, let's compare these rankings to kind of like the top uh, 10 uh, ranked words uh, within the actual car cl cluster itself. It's a bit different here, like if we just look at the entire cluster, again, car and cars dominate, we see more mentions of car engines and dealers. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, I think our output here is uh, basically is very relevant. Uh, so the radar posts are more likely to appear in the car posts because of the dominant thematity of the word cars uh, relative to uh, uh, kind of uh, relative to uh, like the, the, let's say the electronics news groups. So we've able, we've successfully eval looked, uh, evaluated a single cluster and we determined that this cluster is as expected about cars. Uh, but now we want to kind of systematically validate uh, and examine all the other 20 clusters. We want a bird's eye view of uh, the most dominant uh, ranked words within the 20 clusters. And we're going to proceed to do just that using a, uh, a very basic uh, visualization technique called the word, cl uh, word clouds. Word clouds are incredibly simple, so simple that some data scientists look down upon, upon them. Uh, to do a word cloud, we basically get the top X ranked words uh, where we can uh, get the work, uh, do the rankings uh, just by summing up the uh, TFIDF vectors, uh, TFIDF uh, uh, matrix rows associated with those words. We get the top 10, uh, at, let's say the top 10 ranked rows for any particular cluster. And then we just visualize those words in 2D space and word size is going to be proportional to kind of its importance to ranking, aka proportional to its TFIDF sum. And we want to visualize the words and we want to make sure the words don't overlap. This is something that we can actually try to do in matplotlib. Look here, I take a cluster, I take my initial car cluster and I take their TFID, TF rank words uh, rankings and try to visualize the actual words in matplotlib. I get a mess. I see that the word car dominates, uh, but uh, 
this isn't something I can do straight out of the box in uh, Matplotlib. So I'm gonna use this external library called WordCloud. It's really easy to use. I import it. I initialize a, a cloud generator. And now um, what I'm gonna do is uh, I, I, I have I take a dictionary mapping of all the top 10 ranked words uh, to kind of uh, their, 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 their scores, their relevancy scores, those uh, TFIDF sums. I, I create this dictionary and I just call the cloud generators fit words method on top of that dictionary. And then I can, uh, I create an, it, this creates a word cloud image that I can just visualize in uh, Matplotlib using uh, the IM show uh, method. So now we have this word cloud, uh, car and cars dominates. It's uh, the, the, the image, it's informative, it's a bit ugly. The coloring scheme is, is a little off. Uh, the, the background is way too dark. So I'm just gonna optimize the parameters a bit. I'm gonna set the, uh, the background color to white. I'm gonna do some, uh, it's called interpolation. I'm gonna smooth out some of these rough edges around the letters uh it, i'm gonna uh do that it's called this is something that uh matplotlib lets me do during image visualization smooth out and smooth it lets me smooth out the edges of the image by passing uh, interpolation equals bilinear parameter and now our uh output is a little better so we can see that the dominant words are car cars engine Again, it's a very, this is a very simple way of visualizing uh, textual cluster information. Uh, it's not something, it's not the fanciest visualization. You might not necessarily want to put it in the front end UX of your data science product, but in terms of a personal analysis uh, of uh, multiple text topics, text clusters, this simple technique is valuable. So look, we're going to... Um, just uh, code up this cluster to image function that's going to take uh, take in any clusters of our choice and uh, visualize the top 10 to 15 words of a uh, uh, top 10 to 15 ranked words of the cluster and then we're just going to select a random uh, a random cluster ID and uh, visualize the word cloud for that cluster cool so look uh, is this the most beautiful visualization in the world no but it is very informative we see that this particular cluster is about bike and bikes, riding helmets, motorcycles, the road. Uh, it's probably about riding motorcycles. Uh, is that the case? Let's find out by uh, uh, by basically, uh, you know, like getting the top uh, category, the category with the most plurality for uh, this randomly chosen clusters. Surprise, surprise! The cluster appears in in the rec dot motorcycles. Uh, news group um, so our word clouds pretty much inform us of what each cluster is uh, uh, the topic of each new of each news group cluster is uh, about so look we've generated two separate workouts for two distinct clusters but we have 20 clusters and we want to proceed to display all the 20 word clouds simultaneously we're gonna use uh, do this display using matplotlib's uh, uh, subplot functionality we're basically going to visualize uh, each word cloud in a separate subplot. In a, uh, it's going to be a five by four subplot grid. So uh, uh, five word clouds per every row, uh, or oh, four word clouds per every row, uh, five uh, word cloud rows. Uh, e the title of uh, each uh, subplot is going to correspond to the most common news group mentioned in uh, the word cloud that's going to be a sanity check to make sure that kind of like the clustering themes uh, we can uh, uh, that are basically that we get across by reading the names of these word clouds that they're actually correct that uh, they're accurately representing the the news groups that we've uh, uh, that truly cover the topics within these clusters. Okay, so cool. Let's uh, generate uh, this subplot grid. Look, we create a, uh, we're gonna create our 20 axes here. We're gonna make sure the figure size is high because uh, there's gonna be a lot of information. So we want this figure to be basically 20 inches by, or uh, basically 20 pixels by 15 pixels. 
make sure that everything uh, everything fits and then we're gonna for each individual uh, cluster we're gonna create a separate uh, word cloud and visualize it separately okay let's uh, oops uh, what that show what happened here anyway there's an some error in the code but it doesn't matter cuz everything still worked as expected to uh, we have 20 word clouds representing 20 clusters for the most part these uh, 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 these clusters, topic clusters, topic are uh, quite accurate. Look, so here a cluster mentions uh, games, baseball, pitching. It's about baseball. Uh, there's a cluster discussing uh, uh, Christianity with uh, talks of faith and, and church. Uh, here's a very specific cluster, uh, Mac hardware, talks about uh, Mac and Apple. So they're very different from uh, the Windows uh, cluster, which talks about Windows and Windows uh, uh, Windows drivers. Hockey cluster, talking about hockey and also team players, very separate from the baseball uh, uh, cluster. There's a space cluster, talking about space and government and moon and NASA. Uh, here's a political cluster, talking about, uh, you know, like guns and people and government. Uh, Fun encryption cluster, uh, encryption key, and clipper. Uh, look, uh, for the most part, we did a really good job. Not all our clusters are, uh, are, are, are perfect. Not all the uh, work crowds are perfect or significant. For instance, uh, there's a cluster here, uh, medicine. It doesn't appear to be that informative. Like, look, what are the word clouds are like people think, no, at edu. Uh, 